Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB, and joining me for our discussion tonight on food insecurity is LPB reporter and news anchor Natasha Williams. Natasha, it's great to be with you again. Thanks a lot, Beth. It's great to be here on this Thanksgiving week. As we gather together with family to enjoy a bountiful meal, it's a good time to reflect upon our neighbors who may not be as fortunate. It's estimated that more than one in six Louisiana households struggle each year to afford consistent healthy diets. And from 2007 to 2017, Louisiana's share of families experiencing food insecurity rose higher than any other state, nearly six percentage points. Gosh. Compounding the problem of food insecurity is the challenge of food deserts, rural and urban communities without easy access to healthy and affordable food. The USDA estimates over 13 and a half million Americans live in food deserts. So how is Louisiana addressing its food insecurity problem? What health issues does food disparity create? And what can be done to recruit grocery stores to areas that need them the most? Over the next hour, we'll hear various perspectives on cultivating food security. First, an overview. Every other Friday, riders at Baton Rouge's main bus terminal can buy affordable fresh produce at a pop-up store. I've been wanting some bell peppers and I didn't want it so inconvenient sometimes going to the store. Yeah, you know, I catch one bus and I'm here. And then I catch one bus and go back home and eat. The food is delivered from New Orleans by Top Box. Connor Loach is the executive director. Top Box Foods is a nonprofit that has a pretty simple mission, and that's to make healthy food more accessible and affordable uh, in areas that lack access to grocery stores. 17% of East Baton Rouge Parish residents live in areas with low access to grocery stores. The national average is 8%. If we can make enough access in one in certain areas of the city where we know that they lack access, uh, we can really try to push that needle. Uh, in terms of health care and health benefits for eating healthy produce. Top Box has been piloting the program over the last three months with the Capital Area Transit System. Theo Richards is business development manager for CATS. We have over 2,000 customers that's transferring at this bus station on a daily basis and we saw the need for our ridership as well as the community to have access to the fresh produce and food that they provide. The program is one of many in the state to address food deserts and food insecurity. Corey Patty is executive director of Feeding Louisiana. The group supports the state's food banks, which help distribute nearly 77 million pounds of food annually. The Feeding America data says that 773,000 Louisianans face food insecurity, where meaning that they may not know just where their next meal is coming from. According to a report by Loyola University, the highest rates of food insecurity are in the northeastern part of the state, where nearly 30 percent of residents in East Carroll, Madison, and Tinsaw parishes face inconsistent access to healthy food. Louisiana also leads the nation in senior food insecurity. One of the things that uh, our food banks see a lot of times is older folks that are now caring for grandchildren in the home. So. There are some programs that specifically relate to senior food insecurity, serving seniors. The Commodity Supplemental Food Program is a USDA program specifically for folks 60 years and older. The U.S. Department of Agriculture defines food deserts as areas lacking access to fresh fruits, vegetables, and other healthy foods. In March, the Louisiana Agricultural Finance Authority and Hope Enterprise Corporation announced the launch of Louisiana's Healthy Food Retail Program. What this program does is it provides financing to attract grocers, supermarkets, and retail outlets that wouldn't necessarily be uh, incented to go to a low to moderate income area. And these areas are lacking access to healthy foods. 
Kathy Saloy is Vice President of Community and Economic Development for Hope Enterprises. The assistance will be available in the 52 parishes that were affected by Hurricanes Gustav and Ike. Hope has already leveraged over $44 million for healthy food projects in the state. One of the most impactful has been the opening of a food store in the city of Grambling. Legends Grocery Store in Grambling, Louisiana, afforded those residents a grocery store that they did not have for the past 35 years. The nearest city is Ruston, Louisiana, so those residents had to cross the city line and go to Ruston to, um, to get their, their grocery. Hope Enterprise has also entered into a cooperative endeavor agreement with Baton Rouge. Sharon Broom is the city's mayor president. There's no doubt that new grocery stores not only will address the issue of food insecurities and close the grocery gap, uh, but they will also infuse economic development into communities and people will have an opportunity not only to purchase their food, to be a part of the process as employees. The Healthy Baton Rouge Initiative is using $2 million in grants from Humana and Blue Cross to establish community gardens and a mobile market. Broom's administration is also working with dollar stores to provide fresh fruits and vegetable offerings. When you're food insecure, um, you tend to choose low-cost items, which often are high-calorie, less nutrient-dense, and foods that we know would lead to higher levels of overweight and even obesity. Dr. Catherine Champagne is Chief of Dietary Assessment and Nutrition Counseling at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. Obesity costs the state nearly $3 billion per year, according to the Louisiana Department of Health. It also puts individuals at increased risk for additional health problems. The level of diabetes that's related to uh, being overweight is 14 percent, and that uh, ranks us fourth in the nation. For hypertension, we're at 39 percent. That's hypertension that's related to obesity, and that puts us sixth in the nation. Champagne says a healthy diet can be affordable. Well, I think the trick to, to uh, doing that is looking at perhaps uh, having a garden, shopping at farmers markets, purchasing fruits and vegetables that are in season and could perhaps be lower cost. Southern University is working through federal grants to encourage community gardening in food deserts. Market Umbrella, a New Orleans-based nonprofit, offers statewide consulting for farmer markets, and Feeding Louisiana works on long-term solutions to statewide hunger helping the food banks to serve more people and address the needs that exist in communities today, and then encouraging strong policies and programs where we're able to say we're going to be helping people and moving more folks out of poverty so that they're able to provide for themselves. Well, sharing some of their own solutions is our studio audience. It includes representatives from Feeding Louisiana, the Louisiana Budget Project, Market Umbrella, and Together Louisiana. We also got a value food store manager, a community gardener, and a member of the Legislative Youth Advisory Council from Covington. Welcome, everyone. Three months ago, the U.S. Department of Agriculture released the results from its Food Security and Food Purchase Among Low-Income Households Survey. Among the findings, food insecure households spent about 20% of their total budget at convenience stores, while food secure households spent less than 10 percent. Food insecure households buy about 3.6 cups of fruit per week, nearly half that of food secure households, which purchase just over seven cups. Weekly spending for food secure households averages $55 per week for adults. In food insecure households, the amount is about $43. And when it comes to the opinion that healthy foods don't taste as good, 24% of food insecure participants feel this way, compared to just 13% of respondents from food secure households. So let's start our own survey. Tell me your name, who you represent, and how your organization is helping to combat food disparities in Louisiana. I want to start with you, Ms. Aldreamer. Uh, I'm Aldreamer Smith. 
and I, I, I do community gardening, and I have went all over different places, especially South Baton Rouge and other places. People call me about opening, getting a community gardening going. So I go and I give them the information, and we get the garden going, and we have kids, people, anybody who want to participate mm -hmm. to come and help and do the garden. Mm -hmm. And if you help and do the gardening, then you get the food to take home and cook, and even the children. So we had a lot of children coming. I had a lot of children coming, and they, they didn't know what fresh food was. Mm -hmm. You know, I would ask them, you know, I said, well, taste it. And they start tasting, I would give them a carrot or give them, you know, a cucumber or something and let them taste it. And they start eating it just, you know, just ordinarily. So they asked to take some home and I would put it, we would get the food, what we are, uh, what we grow, and I would put it on the table and let each person, a child, mm -hmm take some of the food home to their parents. And I even tell them how to tell their parents how to cook it and prepare it. I teach them how to plant and what to plant and when to plant, and they enjoyed it. And you're I, literally planting a seed a to help se them get healthy food. Healthy food. food. Okay, well thank you mm -hmm. for sharing. Danny, could you uh, tell me your name, who you represent? I'm Danny Mintz. I'm with the Louisiana Budget Project. Uh, we work on policy at the state level uh, to help make sure that people who are struggling to afford to keep food on their tables while keeping the lights on or paying their car note can get help from government programs like the Supp Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, uh, which is SNAP, uh, what used to be known as food stamps. Mm -hmm. Um, and much of our work is focused on these programs because we know that for every meal uh, that a food bank serves, SNAP fe uh, feeds people with 11 meals. Mm -hmm. um, at its root, food insecurity is an issue of resources and poverty and politics. And so we work hard to try to change policy to, to benefit people who just don't have enough. Okay. Let's go back on this side, Candace. Hello, I'm Candace Myers. I'm a health researcher at Pennington Biomedical Research Center here in Baton Rouge. Um, what I do as a health researcher is really uh, what Dr. Champagne was talking about. So we know that food insecurity uh, really decreases a household's or a family's um, ability to purchase maybe healthy foods or make better choices around their foods. And so we know it really decreases diet quality um, and maybe even nutrient quality potentially increases caloric intake just because people are eating poor cho or making poor choices around food. So we know this leads to obesity. And so my primary interest is really better understanding the link between food insecurity and obesity and then how we can take that next step to maybe develop interventions or programs so that we can improve health outcomes in those individuals who do suffer from poverty, who are low income and maybe are food insecure so that we can um, not only ensure that we have a healthy population, but that we're really targeting those people who may suffer the most when it comes to making choices about food. So offering nutrition and diet plans to kind of get people going in the right direction? Absolutely. So it's not just about making sure that people have access to food or that families have enough to eat, but when they have that access at a grocery store that they're making the right choices. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Press, could we uh, hear a little bit about you? Well, I'm a part of Together Louisiana. Uh, I consider myself just a regular citizen who is interested in what happens in our community. Uh, Together Louisiana, of course, is interested in a lot of different issues, but this Healthy Food Initiative is one that's very important. I came to Baton Rouge 56 years ago. When I did, and I still live in the same place I lived then in Scotlandville. Mm -hmm. We had a grocery store. We had uh, every other thing that we needed in that community as well. But over that 56 year period, I've noticed that all of that has dissipated. I watch people go to the uh, family dollars or to the other uh, fast food stores and they buy stuff that is not good for their kids, all for themselves. But I also realize that they have to buy what their uh, family income can afford sometimes. And that is not always good for their diet. Uh, I spent 41 years teaching at Southern University and my goal there was the same as it is now, to make sure our community has what it needs at all times, 
in the right proportions so that we live a happy life. Okay, thank you. Andrew, I'm gonna to go to you because there is a grocery store now in a part of town that had not had a grocery store. Yes. How happy are the residents there to have you there? Tell me who you are and what you represent. Okay, my name is Andrew Burkett III. I'm a manager at Shoppers Value Foods in, at Colonial on Airline Highway. And the residents are ecstatic to have us there. It would be a food desert if we were not there because a lot of our customers don't have transportation. So they're able to walk there and, and get their groceries and so on and so forth. And of course we offer affordable, healthy alternatives like fresh fruit, fruits and vegetables, lean cut meats, fortified dairy and so on and so forth. So we're happy to serve in the North Baton Rouge area. Uh, I'd like to get a youth's perspective. So where's my, okay, Bridget. So tell me who you are, where you're from, and, and your perspective on this. Is this something that young people think about? My name is Bridget Seegers. I'm part of the Louisiana Legislative Youth Advisory Council, which is kind of like a miniature state uh, body of legislators. Um, with my perspective, I go to high school every day, um, and at my high school, 44% um, of our students are on free or reduced lunch. And every day I look at what my friends are eating from our cafeteria. So it's, it, our, our youth are making these choices of what to put in their body every day. And um, Louisiana has one of the highest rates of teen obesity. So we're, we're very much affected by the issue, even if not all of us are engaged in the issue. Okay, thank you. Catherine, let's hear from you. Tell me who you are. Thank you. Catherine Grigsby, and I have worked many years with uh, Together Louisiana and helped with food dis distribution back before California suffered the droughts and then all the fires. They were shipping lots of food here, primarily fresh food, fruits and vegetables, and we distributed it in two particular areas where there are food deserts in Baton Rouge. And it was very rewarding to see people getting fresh broccoli and um, some of them did not know what an avocado was. And so it was really lovely to see that working. And like press, I just care about our community and want us to do the best we can do because we all pay for obesity. Um, we all, in the long run, end up footing the bill because of the health care issues and diabetes. I mean, it's something that affects each and every one of us. It's not something just for the people who live in food deserts. It affects each of us wherever you live. Okay. Erin, let's hear from you. Feeding Louisiana, correct? Yes, I'm Erin Brock with Feeding Louisiana, um, and I work specifically with our policy and our advocacy efforts. So we have a network of food banks and community partners all over the state. Um, and we really want to engage them in the policy decision. They're on the ground in communities facing hunger. They're serving them every day, but they know that when someone comes to them needing a meal, they're coming to them with a whole host of problems and a whole host of challenges that have brought them to that point. So we want to raise their voices in the policy discussion. We want them to know what's going on with programs like SNAP and with potential funding to support food insecure communities, um, as well as making sure that our legislators understand that in Louisiana, hunger is a very significant issue and so we need to be taking direct action. Okay, thank you. Well that is this portion of our show. We've run out of time for it but we'll return in just a bit with our panelists, experts who further discuss cultivating food security. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight we're discussing food insecurity in Louisiana. Joining us now is our panel. Dr. Katherine Parker is executive director of Market Umbrella, a nonprofit that promotes economic development among family farmers and local agricultural enterprises. Market Umbrella also serves as a mentor for public markets throughout the nation by funding workshops and programs that target communities lacking access to fresh food. Edgar Cage is one of the leaders of Together Louisiana, a statewide coalition of congregations and local organizations targeting community problems. Cage has served on the Together Baton Rouge Food Access Research Action Team and the East Baton Rouge Food Access Policy Commission. 
Stephanie Elwood is a licensed horticulturist with the Southern University Agricultural Research Extension Center. Her outreach includes nutritional education for SNAP recipients, implementing gardens on school grounds, Head Start and senior residential campuses to complement ongoing nutritional education classes. Clint Caldwell serves as a general manager for the Shoppers Value Food Stores, headquartered in North Baton Rouge. Shoppers Value Foods operates 12 supermarkets in Louisiana, in North Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Bogalusa, Jefferson, and mostly in moderate and low income areas. Before we go to our audience, I'd like to ask each of you from your perspective, what is the biggest challenge to food security in Louisiana? Start with you. Sure. Um, I would say that one of the biggest challenges that we face at Market Umbrella and with our producers throughout the state is that we lack having enough people who are growing fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, we <coughs> see that there's a lot of commodity crop growers where they grow things like corn, sugar, soybeans, but Convincing someone to go into small farming or farming for fruits and vegetables is really a challenge. And that's important. We want to make sure that we are as self-reliant as possible, that we have a lot that we can choose from locally, and that we have all the places to get it out to, and that these grocery stores we want to have in uh, low-income neighborhoods have the best choices available. Okay, Mr. Cage. Oh uh, Yes, thank you. Well, I think the biggest challenge is obvious is access to the fresh, healthy food. But that is just a symptom of what's happening in our state and our communities. Uh, there are certain issues that economic injustice, social injustices, and political injustice that need to be corrected and addressed where people can have access to fresh, healthy food without the barriers we now place before them because of the reasons I stated. Ms. Elwood? I certainly second um, what these two have said thus far, I think access, and additionally um, having growers, which is what we do, is um, train young people to be growers and also famili familiarity um, to different produce, um, understanding uh, what kale tastes like, what different things taste like. <coughs> so that's a part of growing your own food. If you're growing it as a young person, you're more than likely going to be trying it and eating it as well. Okay, Mr. Caldwell? I'm going to tag on to what Edgar said. Uh, for a moment. Uh, th there's a bigger problem than just food access. Food access is just a symptom of, of some of the economic injustice that does go on. Uh, we operate in low to moderate income areas. Um, we, we operate and we thrive there. And there's a stigma behind those areas that, that seems to be a barrier to, to having economic growth come in. Uh, I, I want to debunk that right now. I mean, we, we do well in those areas. Uh, we love our customers and our customers. We actually have one of our store managers in the audience today and he's been named Mr. 70805 because the, the customers <laughs> love him. Uh, we love being there and we love our customers. And there is a place for the economic growth in these areas. So. Okay. All right, we're going to go to some of the <coughs> questions. Let's start with uh, Betsy. What is your question for the panel? Um, my question is, um, I think we've all agreed that affordable and accessible food in a grocery store or a series of grocery stores is is having that environment is very important. But the other thing is the diet and the change, the cultural change that is required for people to experiment with things that they're not used to, to mm -hmm. eating and they're not used to cooking and that sort of thing. And I know that there are some attempts with, um, you know, cooking classes and that sort of thing. but. How, how do we take that to scale so that we have a real shift in the culture of food purchase and eating? I think one of the main <coughs> things is we have to incentivize people to try new things. Um, lots of times when you're at the grocery store and there's something new there that you're interested in trying, you know, you have to pay out of pocket for that, right? So what if you don't like it and then you end up throwing it away? Well, that feels wasteful, especially if you are of low income. So one of the things that we really like to see and are working on through our markets is a program called Market Match, where we incentivize people using their food stamps to double them um, and buy more fruits and vegetables. So, for example, if they're using their SNAP card at one of our, our farmer's markets, at the Crescent City Farmer's Market, we take that $20 and then double it and make it 40 
And that's a program that could be implemented statewide. It could, it's, could be implemented um, nationwide. I'd like to take a shot at it also. Okay. Um, you, you're right, Betsy. We, we have to change the culture because, unfortunately, we have communities who for decades have not had access to fresh, healthy food. And they've been able to survive on what they've been able to get. We're Together Louisiana, and in particular Together Baton Rouge, we've been working on this issue since uh, 2011. Mm -hmm. Prior to 2012, there were only four articles, 26 years prior, four articles that dealt with food deserts. Since 2012, there have been over 300. We have educated, we have brought this issue to light, and we have also uh, collaborated with partners to include Southern University and LSU Ag Centers that when we have these grocery stores or fresh fruit and vegetable outlets, we will teach people and educate them not only how to shop, but how to prepare the food. Because we have some high rates of obesity, uh, hypertension, and cholesterol in the state, and, and the diet is a key factor. And Catherine alluded to something earlier. Uh, to be, together, Baton Rouge had mobile food pantries where we distributed fresh, healthy food. Lots of times, these people, we, it was kale, avocados, things that they never had a clue. They never even knew what it was. Pomegranates was one. We actually cut some and had people try them, and they loved it. But we also had recipes, recipes that we gave along with those items uh, where people could know how to prepare it and how to do it. So the first thing is access, then education, mm -hmm. where well, they can incorporate in the diets. We can't just have one without the other. Bailey, how about you tell us who you are and then your question, who you represent, and your question for our panel. Sure. Um, I'm Bailey Hoteling. I'm with the LSU Ag Center, uh, assistant professor in the School of Nutrition and Food Sciences. Um, my work focuses on how we can leverage policies, systems, and environments to promote improved dietary quality. Um, and my question for all of you is really surrounding the different modes of food retail um, sites in Louisiana specifically. And so often the conversation is about improving access to supermarkets, and I would agree that that is very important, but what do you all think the role is for non-traditional retail outlets throughout Louisiana, like dollar stores, drug stores, convenience stores, and do you think that role differs if you're talking about urban Louisiana versus uh, rural Louisiana? That's a tough one. Who's tackling? It, it is. I, I, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll try to tackle that one. It was a really, That's really good. good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there has been some experimentation, as you probably know, in the, the dollar store environment with doing perishable foods, fruits, vegetables, meats, and things of that nature. It hasn't really expanded as we would probably like to see it because, as you know, we have in the, uh, the urban areas to some degree and in the rural areas there's a dollar store on every corner. I'm exaggerating that but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so if there was the availability in those locations at least if nothing else to a limited degree I mean, because they're, they're, they have size restrictions and things of that nature of course in the stores. I think that would help the progress of what we need to do here. Uh, now how to make that happen uh, I, I don't 100% have that answer here today, but uh, your point is well made that those facilities are already there, so is there a way that we can figure out how to move what we're talking about here today, fresh foods, into those environments? Yeah. It would probably, wouldn't you think, almost have to be a thing where they would be have, have to be incentivized oh, they would be. to do they, it. They They'd would, have to get a grant or something they, they, that would help would them, uh, you know, in some way no. help the community. You, you know, and, and to be, of course, perfectly blunt, businesses go into business to make right. money. Right. So there, there's got to be the incentive there for them to have some kind of bottom line in these environments. Yeah. Okay. And, and something that we've been working on at Together Louisiana, as we just started talking about, are incentives to, to have these retail outlets in, in all areas of the state uh, where people can have access to fresh, to fresh, healthy food. We incentivize most other businesses and mm -hmm industry, why not the food industry? Why not Why not our people? And as Clinton said, the margins are generally tight in the food business, two to three percent. And and an investor needs initially help, you know, to get started. But we are open and the Healthy Food Retail Act, of which we worked on to get funded with CDBG funds, Community Development Block Grant Funds, uh, incentivize 
access to fresh, healthy food, and, and primarily you get a high priority for Louisiana grown products. So that's, that's an economic development tool, not only for the urban areas, but for the rural areas. The farmers can create co-ops, they whatever, to, to bring their uh, products to market. This is a, an option for the Healthy Food Retail Act that they can receive some funds for. Kathy, what about telling us about mobile markets? So I think what's interesting is that there's a lot of non-traditional opportunities for food distribution that um, we, we could be more creative with than thinking about. Uh, while everyone would love to be able to have a grocery store within a mile of them, it's just not possible sometimes in places where there's not enough population <coughs> to support that store. Um, however, what we can do is there are ways to do, um, have farmers markets, there's mobile markets, which potentially can be where um, a producer and maybe a group of producers goes to a certain location and then rotates throughout the community. Um, other food distribution mechanisms can be located in schools or community centers. So I think there's ways to look at existing places that the community goes to and figure out instead of um, locating somewhere off to the side from where they weren't, where they would not intend to go, find out where they're already going and how can you add in another layer to that. Okay. Um, Corey, tell us who you are, who you represent, and your question. I'm Corey Patty with Feeding Louisiana. Uh, my question relates to some of the vulnerable populations that we have here in the state as with dealing with food insecurity. So Louisiana leads the nation in senior food insecurity, folks 60 and over. Uh, Louisiana is one of the leading states in child food insecurity where more than 200,000 of our children uh, don't know where their next meal might come from. That's almost one in four of Louisiana's children. So I guess my question is, what are the opportunities that, that we have, whether it's through uh, programs or policies or some initiatives to try and move the needle for those specific populations? One thing that we do at Southern um, through our SNAP Ed program is we do work at um, senior residential homes and we do um, container gardens and a lot of that is learning knowledge from the seniors about growing food and then be able, being able to harness that and then um, we also teach youth as well. So um, I think you know from my perspective as a garden instructor um, being able to know how to grow your own food as Miss Aldrima said earlier is one of um, the most um, secure and sustainable things that um, that surrounds food you know security and that's something that we focus on at Southern at the Ag Center is education. And you go to local schools and build little gardens so they can kind of get it early and kind of I guess take it with them. Yeah so through our SNAP Ed program wherever we're um, currently teaching nutrition education um, through our Growing Healthy program that I coordinate, we build a garden on that um, school campus and then that supplements the education for um, nutrition education and the students get to learn how to grow it and then how to eat from it as well. Okay, pretty awesome. Okay, Ms. Aldrima? We had a mobile market that we would take to the different communities. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I live in South Baton Rouge mm -hmm. and they would ask me where did I think we could carried a mobile market mm -hmm. to the people mm -hmm. to come and buy the food. Mm -hmm. And I had several places where I knew the people didn't have a way to get to mm -hmm. the market and mm -hmm. we would bring it, I would bring it to them. Mm -hmm. And usually it didn't work. Mm -hmm. it, they, they wouldn't even come out and buy from us. And I mm -hmm. mean we gave them all kind of different things you know that you know we would give them extra s tokens and everything, but it it some somehow I don't know some people they just don't want fresh food. I guess they education just has to be a major yeah. component education of that. Is, exactly, is certainly part exactly. of it. Exactly, um, and that's what they But I would also say that um, consistency and regularity mm -hmm. are right. really important. Um, right. Knowing exactly where something is going to be. Right. The same time every day, and also right. knowing what's going to be there. So one of the things about mobile markets sometimes, or even farmers markets, which we operate at Market Umbrella, right. is that customers or shoppers are wondering, well, what do they have there? How much is it? And it depends. Um, so that's you know where education is important to learn the seasonality mm -hmm. and to add on to that what we grow here and what we don't grow here and why you don't find grapes, for example, at a farmers market, right. those kinds of things. 
Um, but there's a lot we can do in terms of encouraging people to take advantage, like Corey was saying, of some of the existing programs that we have. Back, just to quickly go back to your question. Um, that we have so many opportunities to encourage people to sign up for existing programs like food stamps mm -hmm. um, to make sure Smart. that they can get what they need to close the gap in that food budget because these working families have children and they really need to be able to eat an, a healthy meal. And when you talk mm -hmm. about SNAP, um, some people don't realize that there are things that you can buy with SNAP that you, I guess, traditionally wouldn't think you could buy with SNAP. Fresh mm -hmm. vegetables? Absolutely. Like I mean, mm -hmm. fresh fruits and vegetables are one of the things that, you know, improves our diet, improves our mental health, and they help people learn. They help us all grow and thrive. And with SNAP, to make sure that that's, you know, even more incentivized, we double those purchases at the Crescent City Farmer's Market. And they also do similar programs in other markets around the state as well. Oh, so to debunk some of the things, what can you buy with SNAP and what can't you buy? And because I, I, SNAP is kind of, a, I guess, in a situation where it could be cut now because of uh, some of the current policies mm -hmm. that are being studied. Right, well you can't buy, for example, hot prepared food with SNAP okay. unless you're in a post-disaster area. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that people are often point to, you know, oh, they're getting some big hot meal or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, that's only if you're in, you know, in a hurricane situation mm -hmm. right after they, you know, let people use those dollars for that. You certainly cannot buy alcohol mm -hmm. or tobacco with SNAP mm -hmm. funds. So that's one of the, uh, the other misnomers about that as well. Okay. I'm going to age myself a little bit when I say this. Uh, but back when I was a kid going to school, we had field trips. And we would go to various things, <coughs> fire stations. But the grocery store was one of those. I don't see that occurring today. At least we don't see it in our environment, mm -hmm. in our store. We would love to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and I say that from the standpoint of this, making our population healthier, as, as we mentioned earlier, we've got the fir fourth worst state for obesity mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. For making us healthier, we've got to start with our children. We've mm -hmm. got to educate right. them mm -hmm. to what it is. So if I, I, I'm just saying for, from our standpoint, we would love to have you know, a, a class of children come through our stores and let us walk through and tell them about what's healthy for them and what's not healthy you for them. You folks listening out there? <laughs> <laughs> just call and, them up. I mean, and, and, and the invitation <laughs> is open, I will say that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Can that, that, that is, I think, so important for us to, we have created a culture, a, a, a food environment, I will call it, mm -hmm. uh, through our culture that has become very, very unhealthy for a mm -hmm. lot of our community. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and to, to segue off of what Clint just said, there, there is a need for a culture change. There is a need for culture change at, at policy. There is a need for a culture change the way in investors, how they choose and select mm -hmm. where to put stores. Mm -hmm. Because in some areas of our state, you have 10 supermarkets within a three block area. Mm -hmm. Other parts, you don't have them for miles and miles and miles. And there also is a need for us as citizens, as community members, to change. We have to demand. We have to demand that these stores carry certain items, mm -hmm. that fresh, healthy foods. We don't have to just sit back and accept it. If we organize ourselves, we can go to some of these stores. Which we've had here in Baton Rouge, we had a uh, healthy corner store initiative mm -hmm. where we, we required stores to offer fresh, healthy food options. Now, mm -hmm. we gave them an incentive, but they, they accepted and it. And you see them at the counter, apples and oranges, oranges and, 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 and stuff. Low fat milk and cheese mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Yeah, so I'm saying there's a need that we all have a part to play. Mm -hmm. I don't want the citizens just to sit back and think that I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. I can only go to that corner store and get what they offer. No, well, you can organize and you can start demanding mm -hmm. that you get an apple. And when, when you find the apple, make sure it's affordable because in, in the low, in the food deserts now, if you find a head of lettuce or a tomato, you probably can't afford it yes. because mm -hmm. it's four or five times higher than would, where it would be in other areas of town. Are there state programs of some sort that kind of uh, will come in and try to help alleviate this problem? Are there grants or funds or something that you can get to try to have a, a store that offers uh, certain things? We had some local uh, local grants here in Baton Rouge that allowed us to to do that through some of the, um, the health insurance companies. They mm -hmm. provided some grants, but I, I'm sure there, if there aren't, there should be. Okay something that we might can look at, try to develop. Okay. Uh, Bridget, how about a question? Tell me who you are and 
Hi, I'm Bridget from um, the Louisiana Legislative Youth Advisory Council. Um, my question is, what are some factors that are dissuading grocery stores from opening in food insecure areas, and how are these factors being eliminated? You want me to jump on this one, Edgar? Yeah, you, that you, would you be just good. started. I'll, I'll come after you. Yeah. <laughs> there is, and, and, and we, and I've worked with Edgar for several years on that, that particular question that you, you ask. And I, mm -hmm. I started off earlier talking about a stigma. <laughs> and, and that is something that we've got to get beyond that, that st stigma. <clears throat> There's a, I'm exaggerating this as well. There's a million different things that somebody will look at when they're looking at putting a grocery store in a location. Uh, you know, a lot of demographic information, how much per square foot the building is going to cost, what type of store is it going to be, uh, which determines what the, the cost per square foot is going to be. Uh, the the <clears throat> What Edgar and, and a lot of other people spend a lot of time doing, working on these incentives to get people to come to these, these quote unquote food deserts. I, I think that's what we've got to do. I think we've got to take it from a a, somebody's got to champion this, in my opinion, uh, developing the marketing pieces and things of that nature that they can go to different companies with, say, here's your incentives to come here, here's, here's the demographics of this area, here's how much grocery business is available weekly in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think there, there's, I'll go back to saying I think there needs to be a, a champion probably in the public sector, <coughs> I'm going to say where that needs to come from, that champions this mm -hmm. to try to get that. They get one and it succeeds, and then that opens the door to more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's nine, there are, I assume this is still right, mm -hmm. there's nine defined food deserts in East Baton Rouge, Paris. Right. 103,000 people will live within these food deserts. That's probably the fifth biggest city in the state of Louisiana, if you think about it like that. I hadn't mm -hmm. looked at populations, I'm just throwing something out there. But think about that, 103,000 people live in just in East Baton Rouge Parish that don't have adequate access to food. We should be ashamed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and segue, the richest mm -hmm. country in, in the world, we have people who are food insecure. That that just doesn't make any sense at all. But as, as Clint said, uh, I was on the Food Access Policy Commission, in fact, I was the chair of it. Well, we did an extensive study of the food desert, of food insecurity uh, situation issue in East Baton Rouge Parish. And we traveled throughout the country, looked at best practices. What was missing here in Baton Rouge was that there was no champion, no place the, a person, a developer could go where someone can take them by the hand and say you need to do A, B, C and D hmm. if you want to open up a grocery store. Hmm. Baltimore has a great program mm -hmm. that that's what they're doing. So with Together Baton Rouge and Together Louisiana, we were successful in, in getting um, Mayor Broom to commit to $1.8 million in incentives to attract healthy food outlets, retail outlets to those, to those underserved areas. So we, we, need, we need policy and we need the cultural change and we need somebody, as Clint said, to be to be a champion of this issue. We can't just let it j just ignore it any longer. So the people who are boots on the ground, Stephanie, what are your some one of your more successful um, projects that you've had in trying to teach and educate uh, about growing your own food, sustaining yourself? Well, um, we we hold workshops um, twice a year at Southern. We have one coming up. It's the Fall gar Garden Workshop. It's um, next Tuesday. And what we do there is we actually invite local farmers um, from Louisiana, primarily minority farmers, mm -hmm. who are doing it, um, teach us how they're doing it, um, what to do. Uh, for example, we have um, food preservation. We have um, a presentation on that, on hydroponics. We have mm -hmm. one, I'm doing one on eating local for Louisiana, so when things are in season mm -hmm. and you know when they can be a good price. Um, so we focus on that outreach through different workshops and um, like I mentioned earlier our SNAP Ed program mm -hmm. and I also work with a program um, that teaches adjudicated and incarcerated youth um, how to grow their own food and that focuses not only on that um, physical health but also the mental health of gardening so we okay. do all of that. Okay. So Candace do you have a question for us? Tell us who you are again. Sure. So I'm Candace Myers. I'm a health researcher, uh, assistant professor at Pennington Biomedical Research Center. And so the question I had was there was a recent um, review of the literature, of all the published literature that looked at 
uh, food insecurity on post uh, secondary education campuses. So, mm -hmm. college mm -hmm. uh, campuses and college universities. And what they mm -hmm. concluded from this published uh, research was that food insecurity is really a prevalent public health issue on college campuses, so much so that when they compared how college students were reporting being food insecure, it was very much greater than what we see in the general population. So we're talking about a, a unique population um, in a unique time of their life. So are there any programs that are currently underway on college campuses to address food insecurity in students? Or are there specific programs that we see in the community that actually may uh, work quite well on college campuses too? It's a great question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> Danny. <laughs> okay. If Danny wants to well, start, I can add. So I, I would say uh, one issue. Um, this is a, a very important issue, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. indeed, the college student population, both at four-year and two-year institutions, experiences food insecurity at rates substantially higher than the population as a whole. One uh, contributing factor to this is that the rules around uh, SNAP access mm -hmm. for college mm -hmm. students are very complicated and are designed to exclude the college student population. This has been the case since the 1970s, and it comes from a position uh, that says essentially, look, we think college students are probably poor on paper, but they may have resources from their families mm -hmm. that can help support them. Well, that's generally not the case. 76% of college students uh, at four-year and two-year institutions mm -hmm. are non-traditional students. Mm -hmm. That means they may be working more than half time, they may have a child, they may be an adult learner. Um, and so one thing that Louisiana has already put into place is a change in the rules for SNAP uh, in the state that allows community college students to access uh, SNAP benefits if they're enrolled in, in certain programs. Federal law restricts which programs um, are allowed to, take to access this, uh, uh, this, this benefit. But other, other uh, institutions have had great success with programs that allow students to share meal swipes, uh, with pantries on campus, with programs to uh, make sure that uh, campus stores can accept EBT mm -hmm. uh, for students who qualify for SNAP, even if they're not in one of those programs. Um, but in general, I, I think uh, college students face tremendous challenges, many of them um, are going to school while living full lives, including full work schedules, caring for children, um, and uh, being adults. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think recognizing that that population has uh, needs that we as a state need to address is, is the first step. Mm -hmm. Mr. Robinson, do you have a question? Yes, I think earlier <coughs> it was mentioned that one of the problems that was being uh, had was that getting small farmers to grow fruits and vegetables. How do we change that? Well, I think what we've been doing is partnering with um, LSU Ag to train new and beginning farmers to help expand their, op their current operations um, and teach them the skills that they need to either grow more or act like acquire new land, um, maybe through lease, through family, or other means to try to get them to grow in that way. Um, other states have had a little bit of success in uh, convincing some farmers to convert portions of their commodity crop lands for fruit and vegetable production. So that's another area that we could certainly look into in Louisiana. Okay. Um, additionally, okay. so how do we change that culture of the last thing I want to do when I grow up is be a farmer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, where my grandpa made sure that my mom and you know or my dad didn't have to do all that work. Mm -hmm. Well, it's um, changing the perspective of what a gardener is or what a farmer is. Uh, for example, today um, kids would be more, might be more interested in doing more of urban farming. So, um, and also us, you know, as community members, as people in Louisiana, how do we uh, celebrate the farmer? How do we make sure that our children know that that is, you know, one of the number one things that you can be in your life is knowing how to grow food and then providing it for other people. And so, the importance of it. And the importance of it, certainly, mm -hmm. I agree. Mr. Burkett, do you have a question? I do. As an organization that already, you know, supports a healthy lifestyle through what we offer, mm -hmm. how can we better promote that for our customers? Mm -hmm. Any ideas yeah. on that? Encouraging folks to buy lots of big foods. signage around that produce. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> lots of tastings. <laughs> we are, yeah, yeah. In our in our research, when we did it, we worked with the Southern Ag Center and LSU Ag Center, and and I'm sure they still have the resources would be available to come and do demonstrations in your store. Because you know we are 
Louisiana, we, 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 don't, we don't eat to live, we live to eat. <laughs> and we're the only place in the country that puts food on top of food. That's a fave <laughs> on fish. <laughs> okay. So I'm saying, uh, I think if, if, if you can collaborate with those ag centers and come mm -hmm. up with some demonstrations on, on how to shop, like the perimeter, mm -hmm. and then how to prepare and have, have a tasting, I think you, you can go yeah. a long way in help promoting the health of your customers. Partnering with your local SNAP app. Yeah. Yes. Okay. The nutrition education. Okay. Mm -hmm. Catherine, do you have a question? The money that was announced yesterday, is that sort of signed, sealed, and delivered that it must be in a food desert? Yes, yes. That's yes, been a low-income low census track, and it's a, a competitive uh, Explain exactly program. what that is. Okay, it's the uh, East Baton Rouge Parish Healthy Food Retail Initiative. Mm -hmm where we have $1.8 million program to attract uh, retail healthy food outlets in those underserved areas. It has to be a, a low income census tract, which a food desert is defined by the USDA as being a popular, in a low income census tract, where 33% of the population, or, or, or minimum 500 people, live a mile or more from a large grocery store supermarket in an urban area and it's 10 miles in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. okay. But that's all, all in low income census tracts, the projects will be awarded. And I would like to ask you a question. Does 1.8 million even scratch the surface? <laughs> hmm. it, it, again, it depends on the variables. It, it uh, depends on the size of the store, the type of store you want to put in. Uh, I would tell you grocery store on an average, uh, I'm just going to throw this out, on an average a grocery store is going to cost you about $100 per square foot. Uh, so if you put in a 20,000 square foot grocery store, you're going to spend $2 million putting that store in. So that, that's, that, that's just a general rule of thumb that, that, mm -hmm. that's out there. Now, and, and this program is designed as an incentive, not a fully mm -hmm. fund mm -hmm. the right. project, but as an incentive to help you get started and to get you over the hump that those initial costs for infrastructure and things they're of that hoping nature. to get a few grocery stores with right. the partnership yes. of the city grant yeah, right. and what these incentives are, are designed to help with the first five to seven years are the most critical yeah. years mm -hmm. of a grocery store a after that point in time typically the debt is paid down pretty low at that point mm -hmm. uh, so these incentives are there to help mm -hmm. bridge that time yeah. frame mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Catherine, I said $1.8 million, but with Hope Financials, this they will leverage this to get public, other public and private dollars to add to this, this so pot. Match but that's, that's uh -huh. the base to attract other uh, partners to fund these uh, projects. Okay. Uh, we're just about out of time, so let's start with some final thoughts, Dr. Parker. Sure. Um, I think that it's really imperative that we all think about ways to engage in our own communities, engage the people that we live work with, the people that we work with, about how they can eat healthy at home and then encourage other people to eat healthy with them. Advocating for some of these wonderful incentive programs like Market Match and SNAP incentives and grocery store incentives I think is a great place to start. Mr. Cage? Yeah, I, I think it's important that, that we have to, to, to really get behind and really ensure and, and guarantee that all our citizens have an opportunity for a quality life, mm -hmm. access to fresh, healthy foods. Because when one of us suffer, we all mm -hmm. suffer. We either take care of them now or we will take care of them later. And mm -hmm. I think we have to get the perception out that these areas are, are bad areas that, as Clint said, you can't make any money. You can't. You can and yeah. you will because That's people right. will eat. They That's have right. to eat. Mm -hmm. So we want you to come to those areas. Very much so on the large scale and on the more micro scale. I know personally I did not grow up eating kale. I didn't grow up eating, you know, different things like that. Um, but it, it came to a point where I was an adult and I was diagnosed with reactive hypoglycemia, which is a sugar issue, and that I was forced to eat healthy. So what I do is I teach my students, you don't have to wait until you get sick to mm. eat healthy. You can mm -hmm. start adding more fruits and vegetables today. I'm not telling you to stop eating your ramen noodles or your Pop-Tarts, but just <laughs> add more fruits and vegetables <laughs> to it. And um, not only the physical benefits that come from growing your own food and gardening, but also the mental benefits that come with that. Um, it's extraordinary, and mm -hmm. I encourage everyone to try it and you'll love it as well. well. There's nothing like growing your own and just seeing nothing it come like out of the it. ground. Mm -hmm. yeah, nothing like it. it. <laughs> Mr. Caldwell. Food is a basic human need, as we all yes. know. 
and and every human being has the right to have fresh, healthy food available to them. Um, we, as as a population of this state, as population of this country, we've all got to be advocates to to fix that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it 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 breaks my heart when I think about these seniors that are sitting out there that don't have access to food. Uh, I mean, I don't even want to think about that because I'll start tearing up, honestly. <clears throat> but that, mm -hmm. that we all have to get passionate about it. We all have to be advocates for this, get our neighbors to be advocates for this, and get our politicians to be advocates for this. So. We've run out of time for our question and answer segment. We'd like to thank our panel, Dr. Parker, Mr. Cage, Ms. Elwood, and Mr. Caldwell for their insight this month on this topic. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. You can find food and security resources there. If you want to comment on tonight's show, click on the Join the Conversation tab. We'd love to hear from you. After a hotly contested gubernatorial race, Governor John Bell Edwards has won re-election. Join Louisiana Public Square next month as we hear from campaign insiders about the battle for the governor's mansion. We'll also explore the ramifications of a so many newly elected legislators. Join us for Election Reflection 2019, Wednesday, December 18th. Thanks for watching and good night. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.